Hey, everybody. Welcome back for season two of the Broken Banquet podcast. This season, we've got more interviews with missionaries around the world, more interviews with authors who have written amazing books about missions, and more conversations about what it means for us to abide with one another. And yes, probably a story or two about Ashley taking a walk, eating food, or having drinks with someone who she now loves. We're so glad you're back. We're glad to be back. And we hope that you will enjoy this episode. It's a beautiful day in sunny Auckland, New Zealand. It is. It's finally sunny Auckland, New Zealand. Yeah, I think it's your shining uh, disposition that finally reflected in the weather. Is that what we're going to start with yep. today? Mm-hmm. My shiny disposition. Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm thrilled to be here. Whether you can tell or not from the sound of my voice, I love this. It's been a wonderful experience. We've gotten to spend time with wonderful people. I just love seeing church and and people who love Jesus around the world in different places and learning from them and, and getting to know them. And we've definitely gotten to do quite a bit of that for the last few days. And we're going to keep doing that today. So do you want to tell folks who we're talking to today? Yes. In 2018, I had the pleasure of attending Shore Community Church in Auckland, New Zealand for the very first time. And the senior pastor, Ruben Munn, uh, gave a fascinating uh, sermon that day. And ever since then, I have podcasted the Sunday sermon and listened to it because he is an extraordinary communicator. So I could not wait to introduce you to Ruben Munn. Ruben, welcome to the Broken Banquet. Oh, kia ora, Will. Kia ora, Ashley. Thank you for having me on the podcast. And welcome to New Zealand. Good to have you here. Yeah, it's good to be here again. Yeah. I was telling Will, I mean, it's been since 2019 because of the whole COVID thing that yeah. that, uh, that we've been here. So it's nice to get back and to see people that we love and have meals together, go on walks. Now, I have not had a meal with Ruben, mm. and I have not gone on a walk with him. Mm. So, um, Well, this is the next best thing. Yeah, a podcast. this is great. It's a this spiritual is so meal. great. Yeah, it's a spiritual add, feast. We may have to add being a guest on our podcast to the list of qualifications for being someone who Ashley loves. There you it's go. It's too limiting for it to be a meal, walk, or drinks. Well, there I'm pleased go. that I will have ticked that box yes. after today, Ashley. <laughs> Me too. I'll finally be in. Me too. <laughs> Very good. Very good. It is not an exclusive club, but it's a good club to be in nonetheless. <laughs> I'm not in many clubs, so I'm really happy to Great. be in this one. This yes, I made it. All right. <laughs> I'm I'm excited to be here because I've been hearing stories about the church here for a while now. I've gotten to know some folks who you know and hear about their experiences here with church planting and church leading here. And uh, they've been on some of the episodes of the first season of The Broken Banquet. We're going to have them back for, for episodes of season two of The Broken Banquet. And so just excited to to hear from you directly and, and to hear about Shore Community Church. That name will sound familiar to folks who pay attention because it's come up already. And I think it's just great that we're getting to paint sort of this complex and, and full picture of church in New Zealand, which is, uh, I hope, interesting for people, certainly interesting for us. So thank you for, for being willing to sit down with us. Uh, we really, we got here without much of an agenda for who we were going to talk to and, and when, and folks have just been so generous with their time to sit down with us, and we're grateful for that. So uh, why don't you just, just start off by telling us a little bit about your background. Who are you? Sure. Yeah. So uh, Ruben Munns, currently the senior pastor, Shaw Community Church, and I've been uh, working for Shaw for 21 years. I had a few different roles within the church over that time. And I guess I'm a product of internal leadership within the church in some ways. Came into the church two years after it was planted. But Anna and I just, uh, we had other jobs at the time. And eventually then came on staff uh, as an associate pastor. Uh, then we went over and spent a couple of years in the US uh, doing some seminary study at Cincinnati Christian University. And then, and, and, and while we were there, the senior minister of the church here left, which was unexpected. And so that was a big curveball for us. So I kind of came back and then quickly transitioned over the first year that we were back into the senior pastor role. A little quicker than I thought, but that's the role I've had now since 2008. And so lead the staff team here, uh, this church, which, and so we're in, in the northern part of Auckland, the north shore of Auckland. And uh, so that's, that's the primary role that I have. And within the context of, of the church here, my, my heart, my, my passion is really around preaching and teaching. That's primarily 
uh, at the heart of my vocation and calling. Uh, but alongside all the work that I do here in the church, I'm also an adjunct lecturer at Laidlaw College, which is a theological college uh, in Auckland. And Ashley, you know about that. You've had some connection there. Yeah. So that, and it's a great theological training school. So there I'm based in the practical theology department. And so able to be a part of training other preachers coming through within a New Zealand context, those that are sensing some sort of calling into pastoral work or on uh, an ordination track or just wondering where God is leading them. And to, so to be able to be part of that kind of homegrown movement in a, in a really culturally diverse space as well of seeing what God's doing and raising up another generation of leaders, pastors, teachers, missionaries, and so on through Laidlaw is great. So that's a really life-giving space for me and to be part of an institution like that. That is actually, Laidlaw has been a real part of New Zealand's mission history as well. It's, it's 100 years old now, Laidlaw College. And so Laidlaw has, has been part of sending a lot of people to the mission field mm -hmm. from New Zealand, particularly in the early mid 20th century. Mm -hmm. New Zealand was the highest missionary sending nation per capita. Uh, through the mid part of the 20th century. So missions was just the air that you breathed within evangelical life in New Zealand. And Laidlaw was a huge part of that. It was started as a mission school and it released a whole lot of graduates into the mission field. I think I heard a number like in one year alone in the 1960s, there were 40 students, 40 something students coming out of Laidlaw, going directly into, into offshore global mission contexts. So really exciting to see that. Um, now, that number has declined over time, just in general, in terms of New Zealand and its, and its missionary sending work. But uh, yeah, so Laidlaw has been part of the story of, of mission in New Zealand. So now to sort of be able to continue that in, in some sense is, is great. So anyway, to, to come back, I kind of sit between the, the church world, I guess, and then the Bible college world and trying to be a part of helping those two to sort of be fused together because the Bible college needs the church to remain contextualized and the church of course needs the bible college the the academic and the theological rigor of what's going on for the for the biblical depth mm -hmm. that we that we look for so i kind of sit that crossroads which is a nice space for me yeah, yeah. <laughs> will you for the benefit of people who maybe haven't listened to the previous episodes where we've talked to folks from new zealand maybe they're tuning in for the very first time would you talk a little bit about just the church in general in new zealand right now mm. yes oh it's a big question yeah i mean it, it ref the, the church landscape in New Zealand, I think, reflects a few different streams, and it is a little bit complex, but I like the way you, you referenced complexity earlier, and it kind of defies easy narratives, I think, of what, what is going on. In one sense, the church in New Zealand is a tiny little minority in one of the most heavily secularized contexts in the Western world. The New Zealand is, is far more secular, um, just based off census figures, than a context like the United States even more secular than Australia. Um, hard to believe, but that's our, that's our story. And so we are, and, and, and secularism in the sense that those that identify as Christians, it's a very small number. And then of course, as you know, it's one thing to identify as a Christian. The number of living, active faith Christians uh, is much smaller than that. And I think it's estimated maybe three or 4% of the population would have a living and active faith uh, maybe 3% or so that are attending church on, on, a, on a given Sunday. So it's a tiny little percentage of the whole population. So we find ourselves as a marginalized group in the public sphere within New Zealand. And that's secularism, right? That that faith is pushed out, deliberately pushed out of the public sphere and given no place within public discourse uh, because we're immediately seen to be prejudiced, biased, bigoted, and so on. So we, we live in that kind of space as a westernized country and yet, there are these interesting other streams that are going on that uh, within the indigenous context of New Zealand is Māori. So Māori as the tangata whenua, the people of the land in New Zealand, uh, as our indigenous people. And that's quite a different picture. Um, Māori are very open, much more open spiritually, um, because the gospel became embedded in Māori culture in the 19th century in a way that it didn't within Pākehā or European culture. And so as early settler missionaries came from Great Britain, very early 19th century. Uh, it was a very mixed bag in terms of what they brought. And there was a lot of colonialism that went on, as as was the case around the world. These are people of their time. Uh, and so they did bring a lot of that cultural imperialism with them. But they also had a heart for the gospel and a heart for the Maori people. And the gospel took off among Maori. Biggest revival in New Zealand history was among Maori in the middle of the 19th century. I think it's estimated between 60 and 80% of Maori were Christian by about the 1860s. 
And so there's a huge awakening to the power of the gospel among the indigenous people of New Zealand. And they've then become carriers of the gospel among their own people, which is really exciting. So it leads to a, a, a different flavor among Maori communities than you have within Pākehā European communities. I was listening to someone part Maori the other day, a pastor, talking and just saying the difference between talking to his New Zealand European friends about the gospel, who are typically hardened, disinterested, don't want to know, and his Maori friends who are open, willing, talk about spiritual things whenever you want, is really, really stark. So again, I think that's an important part of our narrative, and it's easy to sort of just go down the Western you know, secularism story, but there are these other streams. Another within New Zealand is the influence of the Pacific Island cultures. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of Tongan, Fijian, Samoan, and so on. And similar to Maori, these are cultures in which the gospel is deeply embedded. Uh, the influence of mission work coming through the Pacific was immense, and the gospel has taken off in Fiji, Samoa, and Tonga in ways that it just didn't in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And so to, to be uh, within a Fijian cultural context, very normal to go to church. A huge reverence for people who are pastors and people in spiritual authority in a way that's really, really different, again, to uh, white European New Zealanders. So you have that kind of stream as well. And then I would put one more beside that, which is our immigrant communities sure. coming in. New Zealand is one of the most multi-ethnic societies in the world. And so we have a huge diversity of cultures immigrating all the time, not so much during COVID, right. but now again, that's starting to happen. Mm -hmm. So you have huge numbers of Asian communities coming in, uh, Middle East and South American and so on. And one of the things that we're seeing happen then is some of these immigrant communities are coming and they're bringing the gospel with them as well. You, you have Christians coming from places like Iran, mm -hmm. where there is massive revival mm -hmm. going on, and they're bringing the gospel. And so you're sort of having some of the immigrant communities injecting religion or spirituality back into the secular bloodstream of New Zealand through the process of migration, which is a fascinating thing and actually could, some are saying, lead to the renewal in New Zealand through those who are not even indigenous to our country, which I think is wonderful yeah. and fascinating. Well, that's what I wanted to ask about when you were talking specifically about the Maori. Several people have mentioned just in different conversations since we've been here, this kind of resurgence of an interest in mm. the Maori language. Yes. And, and like just how perfect that would be if as people are becoming more interested in the language that that also opens the door for the spirituality it would be really easy to look historically critically at evangelism in different parts of the world and conversion of people groups in different parts of the world to christianity but then to look now and see how some of those people groups are the ones that actually might be the force mm. behind mm. this resurgence in yes. spirituality and then kind of revival. Yes. Like for it to come from there almost is way more exciting than for it to be coming from white Europeans or, yes. or North Americans. Yes. That it's 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 this sort of organic experience. Yes. What a fascinating time to be here and to be a, a church leader here and to be in the midst of all of that complexity mm. that you talk mm. about, that just like that makes the the hair on my arms stand up just because of how exciting that must be to see energy like that happening around the church. I think we're you know, Ashley and I are, are coming coming from a place where there's just yeah, there's good things happening, but there's also a lot of just kind of frustration and and sadness. I feel like around kind of what's going on in in church right now and. Yeah, we have that too. Don't right, worry. Yeah. Right. yeah, we've got all those same dynamics, maybe just in a microcosm form. Yeah. I think we've got a lot of the same sorts of uh, themes and flavors here. Uh, but but you're right in the sense that like, at, at Shaw Community Church is primarily a Pakiha dominant church. So we don't have a huge number of Māori within the church. And so that's, that's a challenge for us. Uh, there's not a lot of Māori living in our local community. But to appreciate that some of, as you're saying, some of the renewal of the gospel in our nation may actually be coming through some of these communities that aren't even yet part of our church is really exciting to us. And it requires a posture of openness, I think. It requires a posture of humility, mm. I think, because it's very easy, I think, for churches that are much more kind of culturally uh, Eurocentric, like ours, to assume that, well, the way that we think about things or do church or understand, just understand the gospel is the way. 
uh, and, and is normative. And so it kind of requires us to be able to try as best we can imperfectly and take some of those blinders off and say, we, we really need to be sensitive to the way the spirit is moving through some cultural streams that may, may look quite different to ours. And to make space for that, uh, even to make space for that within leadership, I think that's a challenge going forward. And yeah, to have that, have that posture of openness. I think one of the dangers that we face in New Zealand is that because what you're saying is correct, there is a renaissance of Māori culture. There is a renaissance of Māori language. And within that context, there is an openness to spiritual things, which is really, really healthy. But what you can then find is that white Christians, in a sense, almost use the leverage of Māori culture just purely to try and use it to get to people from a faith perspective. You know, that we, we in a sense, we almost just want to leverage Māori culture. Yeah. But we'll kind of end up with these quite tokenized forms of Māori language and so on. And I think it takes stepping back and saying, yeah, are, we, are we willing to actually just think about the way that we're using Maori language and culture really respectfully? Mm-hmm. So that's causing us to think more deeply because the surface level stuff is probably the easier stuff. It's a little bit more tricky to dig underneath that. But these are the challenges I think the, the New Zealand church needs to needs to wrestle with. And in the midst of that, even though there is this renewal that comes through Maori culture and other cultures, we're still a really culturally divided nation. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe that's reflected in some of your experience mm-hmm. in the US as well. But there, there are there's a lot of tension still right. between Maori and Pakeha. That surfaces for us every year around Waitangi weekend, which is our national weekend, going back to the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi. And it surfaces a lot of the old grievances that are still there. So I, I just don't want to overpaint this really rosy picture. I don't want to be overly negative either, but just to sort of help to see the, the complexity of all this. There is massive opportunity and there is the sense of renewal that is happening. At the same time, it's hard. Um, we, we're a divided people too. It's complex. We want to do these things without drifting into tokenism. We want to build real relationship here. Did you notice without any prompting that Ruben used... I know, what you're, I know what you're going to say. Okay, I well, go ahead. I know what are the two words that... No, you're going to say them, but I know what are the two words that he used that you're going to say. Humility and openness. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which are two of the things that we come back to over and over again when, when we talk about key ingredients for healthy missional relationships. Mm-hmm. If you don't have those in the mix, things are going to go awry. And it's interesting that we sort of think about these long distance missional relationships, but even right here within the Christian community in New Zealand, you use those words as being important to kind of navigating all of this complexity that's going on right now is being open and being humble. That's fantastic. I have a curious question about the the students coming out of seminary being sent to other nations when there was such as maybe a spiritual yearning perhaps here but instead they were sent out yeah well I, I, a couple of thoughts on that one is that i think historically at least new zealanders have made quite good missionaries overseas mm-hmm. and we we tend to be a pretty practical kind of people mm-hmm. who can just kind of make life work in a range of different environments we don't mind being maybe a little under-resourced mm-hmm. at times and just kind of, you know, there's a kind of Kiwi ingenuity sometimes mm-hmm. that kicks in. And so sometimes Kiwis have made quite good missionaries in some tough places mm-hmm. um, where life is not that easy. And so there's, there's sometimes just been a bit of a draw, I think, to, to different, different contexts, um, sometimes to hard places. Uh, the other thing too, and, and, and I guess this kind of, again, to complicate the picture for everybody, but to provide some nuance is that even though New Zealand has a very small number of active Christians and churches in terms of our overall population, there is still a flourishing Christian community and life uh, and evangelical community within New Zealand. I mean, you, you'll see as you drive around Auckland, there's churches all over the place. And many of those churches are really healthy and thriving. They're, they're not necessarily huge churches, but there are still many faithful Christians doing good work in New Zealand. So there's always that need that is here, uh, and there are Christians that are responding to those needs, I guess, as, as best they can, and churches mm-hmm. as best they can. But at the same time, New Zealand is not a context where uh, it's an unevangelized nation. There has been and continues to be a lot of mission work that's going on, a lot of people reaching their communities, a lot of sharing of the gospel in various forms. And so like the US, there's, there's always a need for more. There's always new new ways of contextualizing the gospel well there's always people that haven't heard mm-hmm. but i think we yeah we don't, we don't want to equate <clears throat> just the absence of confessing christians 
with a total lack of uh, evangelical life. Sure. That, that can still exist, I think, and does exist in a nation like New Zealand. And so I think for that reason, just to answer your question, that's some of the reason that, that Christians with a sense of calling to mission have felt like there are healthy churches here and there is some sense of Christians reaching out to others. And if there is a, an opportunity for me to go abroad, mm -hmm. then I'm willing to look at that. And so I think there's been that, there's been that calling. And it's also, pro I mean, I, I'm no expert on this, but I think it's also been some really active missions agencies mm -hmm. in New Zealand over time uh, that have just engendered a real spirit of willingness mm -hmm. to go and to be sent. And that's good. We need that back. It's also kind of biblical. It's easy for us to think about how... Yeah. Biblical? Sort of, Will? I know, I know. I know. <laughs> but you, to sort of think of, of missionaries going out from like the, you know, the, the spiritual powerhouse out to the rest of the world, but, but the very first missionaries were a very few going out from a small community of faithful to the, the world. And so to me, it kind of makes sense. You know, Constantine kind of screwed that up for everybody but but up until that point that was the dynamic you know yes um yeah yeah and, and there was still a huge need for that i mean again just to bring it back to maori spirituality the, the evangelism among maori is flourishing and thriving and again listening to this uh, maori archdeacon the other day just talking around how at the moment i think they've got around 20 maori evangelists in auckland they need about he thinks about 40 they need about double that to be able to reach in the ways that they want to reach into maori community so i think it reflects not just the number of Māori that are out there, but the openness mm -hmm. and the opportunities mm -hmm. that there are. Yeah. Uh, but it is certainly true that culturally, I mean, to, this is a little bit of a generalization, but the ones that are really actively coming to faith and seeking Christ typically are non-European mm -hmm. in New Zealand. So that is, that's where the energy, that's where the excitement is. Yeah. And that's where, again, we need that posture of openness and humility. Right. Those of us not embedded in those cultural contexts to be willing to support and to resource mm -hmm. and build relationships for, for ministry to Māori, Pacific, Asian communities where we are seeing people come to faith and it's exciting. And so we need to get behind that. One thing I'm going to shift our conversation just a wee bit. Uh, one thing that I neglected to chat with Michael Hansen about, he was served uh, for listeners. If you go back to season one, I believe episode 30 or 29, Michael Hansen, who was on staff here at Shore Community yes. Church. Um, one thing I neglected to ask him was how you all, as Shore Community Church, mm. went from being a church plant mm. to, to then beginning to plant other churches or be a part of other churches um, and and maybe the mission field in itself. So what did that evolution look yeah. like from yeah. being a, a church plant to then being a leader in the church? Yeah, I think it's sort of the the, the strange story of how God's worked in our in our context, but originally a, a team, a North American team, coming over to plant Shore in 1998, mm -hmm. uh, and then within within seven or eight years, all of that team had left for good for good reason, and primarily saw themselves, I think, as church planters, as initiators, mm -hmm. as as the Pauline kind of model of church planting. So to plant and then and then move on. Uh, one of those people, Randall Brooks, just a couple of offices down, is yeah. still here. Uh, great as our community pastor for a little longer. And so he's had a few different stints within the church over that time. And it's awesome to still have someone from the original church planting team mm -hmm. as part of the community, part of the leadership here. Uh, but I think over time, uh, a couple of things have happened. One is that I think our church has, has become, tried to become, as contextualized as we can be to our own local culture mm -hmm. and context. And that's partly reflected through bringing on new leaders and bringing through new leaders. And I would be an example of that. Mm -hmm. So as local, I want to say indigenous leadership coming through, taking taking responsibility. So I would be, from one perspective, a testimony to the humility mm -hmm. of the early leadership of Shaw mm -hmm. to be able to give some responsibility to someone like me, who, when I came on the staff, I did not have any theological training. I was a, I was a big gamble. And, but it was opportunity for me, and that was great. And then to to resource me to go to seminary and so on. So there is um, great mission leadership, mm -hmm. I think, in terms of investing in local leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, we have brought uh, leaders from other cultures into our church, uh, notably South African, uh, because that's a huge culture represented within our church community. Uh, and it's not that we've always gone looking for leaders from particular cultures. It hasn't been quite as tactical as that. But it's just the way, I think, over time that our leadership has more and more reflected a little bit of the local context of Shaw. And I think that's just helped to establish and embed us as not just a church plant, but a church that has longevity, mm -hmm. that is self-sustaining and self-leader-producing. Mm -hmm. And 
well contextualized in our environment. So then the, the second stage of that that's kind of developed and not again, not necessarily the result. I, I wish I could tell you this was some great strategy, but it really, it really wasn't. It's just what God has, has done. Is so you alluded to the way in which church planting. Now I, I can't take credit for for us as a church having planted various other churches, but what has happened is that there's a couple of church planting teams that have come over to New Zealand, and our church, Shaw Community Church, has ended up having this role with kind of like a base uh, for for a first year or two for these teams to become acclimatized, get used to the bad weather, get kind of acculturated. <laughs> that long white cloud. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> to, to many days under the long white cloud uh, and to, to be involved in uh, Kiwi ministry uh, in, in a local church community without immediately the pressure of jumping into planting a church and having to get that up and running from day one. What an opportunity, yeah, an opportunity to look around and investigate where they want to plant mm-hmm. uh, once they're here to meet local leaders and be involved in ministry mm-hmm. within our church ministry um, to New Zealand congregations. And then from there, that becomes a platform for them to plant. And that hasn't become an official shore church plant. Mm-hmm. They're doing their own thing, but we've loved and blessed and just been a bit of a base for them to do that. Is that something that you feel like the the congregation recognizes that that's part of what you all as a church have been called to be in this community? Or is that something that sort of the folks in the office kind of talk about that? But uh, I mean, it's because uh, what an incredible ministry as as a missionary who left home and went out into the field. I went into a place where I also already kind of had a community waiting for me, thank yeah. goodness. And so that part wasn't a real hard adjustment for me to make but i've always been sensitive to missionaries who don't have that and so for you all to provide a place for people to land Mm -hmm. and have that time we talked really early on in several episodes about how important it is to give missionaries and missionary families time Mm -hmm. so often the folks that send them into the field within weeks they won't progress reports and and that kind of stuff how many churches do you build yeah yes (laughs) But instead, to give them time and and a place, a community to just be here before they start doing things. Do you think the church recognizes that that's something that that is happening here? Yeah, I, I, it's not something that's been part of a of a grand vision or something that we've kind of named as 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 a as a big strategic direction. I think it's it's probably bubbled away a little bit more quietly than that. And and I think. Partly that's just the providence of how it came about. In some ways, I think this is just the ministry God's graciously gifted to us. Um, so we've certainly talked with with the church around what these teams are doing. Um, we've had them sharing their their own their plans and so on with the church. We've prayed and blessed and sent. Uh, but it's just been something that has happened through relationship. Yeah. Uh, and often the relationships that these folk have had with particular ministries and individuals within the church. And so it's just bubbled along, sometimes just quietly below the radar. And I've been okay with that. Yeah, yeah w- w- whether that will continue to be part of our ministry or not. I think, again, there's a posture of openness. Mm-hmm. There's a posture of hospitality. Mm-hmm. But also just a sense of, well, Lord, this might this might have been something for a season. Mm-hmm. Um, and it might be something that becomes part of the ongoing mission of the church. But but I, I certainly echo what you're saying. But there, I can see the value mm-hmm. in just giving that time. And, and we just become part of the landing place for them. And, and I think it all contributes to good uh, context-based ministry mm-hmm. to be able to get a little more understanding of the people and the land yeah. and the community, um, to make relationships and form relationships on the ground, even with other local churches in the area. Um, because again, it can be sometimes a product of thinking, well, there's no churches in New Zealand. It doesn't really matter where we plant. Um, and just to at least work in with, well, wh- who are other evangelical leaders in this context? And let's make those connections before we just arrive in this neighborhood. All of that you can do without all of the pressure of suddenly we've got to, you know, we've got to run a budget and mm-hmm. we've got to get people in our building and we've got to run services. So it's like pressure's off for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. And and from our perspective, this is not a formal, like these people are not on our payroll. This is not sort of a formal arrangement. They're just here. And for us, it's a case of, well, what doors can we help open for them yeah. while they're here? Doors internally in terms of ministry and just exposure to local local ministry. 
and externally. So our own networks with other Christians and leaders and community people and just trying to open those doors for them as well. That's really the ministry. So it is largely informal and relational. It's just the way it's evolved. You know, I just can't not think about people that I know personally, and I know Ashley knows people like this as, as well, who, I mean, they their hearts were in the right place. They were They were trained or prepared the right way. But when they got to where they were going, because there wasn't that kind of a community for them to land in, it didn't work, and they wind up coming home. And what a gift! Um, yeah, I think I think it's important, and, and and I I agree that ultimately the hope is that it leads to more healthy churches yeah. being yeah. planted yeah. because they're being planted the right way from the beginning, yeah, and coming out of good soil. Well, then, and you all even took it one step further by sending two of your leadership couples to go to Church Northwest to be part of the planting team for a new church. Yeah. 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 We we, we let them go. We let them go. (laughs) Well, and that's incredibly generous. You sent four incredibly Mm. strong leaders of your church, like vital members of your church to go to another place. What a beautiful mm. act of generosity yeah. and trust and trust yes. that right. they would come back that's right that's right we, we hope they would right. yeah right. that's right we kept them on a tight leash yeah. uh yeah i think again there's that kind of just that question of asking how best could we serve this church mm-hmm. um and it's again not not as simplistic as well would just send people to go and plant a church it's really thinking well what 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 is what is the gift that would be most useful mm-hmm. to them and it turns out that what they really needed were, was a healthy eldership mm-hmm. in the early days where they didn't necessarily have people from within the congregation that were ready to step into that space. And we had a good, healthy eldership and people that had a bit of capacity. And I think from the perspective of our, of our elders as well, this was a great way for us and these particular elders to be involved in serving and being part of a missional context, which is really interesting and really exciting. They had skills that were uh, business skills and so on that were useful in that church context, especially in getting up and running some of the governance issues that you need to sort out. In New Zealand, that means becoming a charitable trust. With all that goes along with that, there's legal things that need to happen. And so it's saying, well, if we've got some people that have got this kind of skill set and these people are functioning as spiritual shepherds and they're able to go for a time, and it was always the idea of like, this is a season, you know, and that's okay. Uh, then that's that's a way of, of blessing. And I think it was a really positive experience. I, honestly, I think it was really great for the elders themselves to do that. I think it was quite rejuvenating for them to be part of this pioneering mission venture. I mean, by this point, Shaw is very much an established church. And for the tenure of those elders, they, they, they're coming into a church that's no longer a church plant, but an established church. But here now we're part of the startup. And it's like, this is good. This brings freshness into our community and back into our eldership. And these elders are turning back up at our elders meetings, bringing the updates of what's going on at Church Northwest and just helping to create that kind of relationship. And that that um, synergy between the two churches, so it was it was good. Yeah, I, I trust that it was a good gift for Church Northwest. And then I think just in the fullness of time, when there was a stable eldership, mm-hmm. where they were on their feet a little bit more, these elders were then able to pull back, and and come back. And and I mean, they've always been part of our eldership team, so nothing nothing changed. Right. But yeah, I, I see that as just one of those kind of nuanced ways that you can bless a missional movement, maybe in ways you don't automatically think of. But just asking the question of what what is the need and, and who are we and what do we have and what gifts and skills has God given us and what's the best use of, of all that. So that, yeah, that really worked well. You know, when we asked, I think it was Hamish, when we when we talked to him last season and asked, we, we like to ask people what they think the, the, the people from their community bring to the table. When we think about this table imagery and this, this banquet that has been broken and our hope that by engaging in healthy relationships with one another, missional relationships, abiding with one another, that that can be part of healing what is broken about this banquet currently. And so we ask people, what are the the, the things that you're most excited about your community where you're serving, bringing to the table that I'm going to learn from them, that I'm going to be challenged by, you know, from learning about them? And and I'm pretty sure Hamish's answer was humility. Yeah that they would come to the table with humble hearts. And I'm curious, uh, you've mentioned that already, so I'm sure that's something that you're you're pleased that that's part of sort of church identity here. Is there something else about Kiwi Christian culture that, that you think it's a good thing for those guys that we're coming to the table with that, 
gift for them to see and experience. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, ha- Hamish in, in naming humility, that's that's a really important one. Uh, but to choose something else, I think the, the, the diversity within our own cultural context, I think there's a real richness there. Uh, and I think that that's something that we're already expressing some ways better than others within our context. But I think the Kiwi Church does bring a really multi-ethnic kind of uh, flavor to the body of Christ. And in its best form, I guess, you could say that this is a little taste of the kingdom of heaven and the banquet, you know, on on earth now, that we do have these multi-ethnic churches. Um, Some are more homogenous, but others, you know, very, very diverse. And we and we have it's the every tribe, every tongue, every nation gathered around the throne. And so, some Sunday mornings in Aotearoa, New Zealand, you will see that, and you will see brothers and sisters in Christ from such a range of nations mm-hmm. worshiping together, uh, sometimes in multiple languages, uh, side by side, in a in a way that is integrated and reflects something of the unity and diversity mm-hmm. of of the body of Christ. And I think that's really good. I think it reminds us that culture is important and doesn't get set aside. Mm-hmm. In the kingdom of heaven, sometimes there's kind of this nebulous idea that we leave our culture at the door and there's, and we go into this other thing, like the kingdom just, you know, erases all of those distinctions. Yeah. But I think, yeah, it's so good. And maybe this is something that as, a, as, as New Zealand uh, Christians that we bring is bringing our culture with us mm-hmm. and believing that that is, um, that's part of who we are just as human beings made in the image of God. It will be part of who we are in heaven. Mm-hmm. And it's part of this, this missional spirit as well as that we can keep culture in the foreground and relate to one another. So we're relating to each other cross-culturally all the time. And that means thinking through what the gospel looks like in different cultural contexts, but really celebrating that mm-hmm. diversity and really lifting that up rather than believing it's some sort of distraction mm-hmm. to the body of Christ. There are things about culture that when coupled with the gospel can do incredible damage. But there are, but that doesn't mean that we should completely disconnect culture from the gospel. Mm-hmm. There are also things about culture that, when coupled from or coupled with the gospel, can be incredible mm-hmm. blessing. And yes. yeah, yeah, and that's and it's yeah, that is that is complex. And yeah. so there, therein is the is the real challenge because you're right. There, then there are there are times that sometimes you're right, says so that culture can can get in the way if all we see is culture. And then it can sometimes become divisive when we major on the things that divide us culturally. And we are are not immune to that. All of those tensions are there. All of those struggles are there. So I'm not trying to sugarcoat it. Uh, But I think, you know, it's it's just it's seeking to be more expressive of what the body of Christ should look like in all of its all of its cultural diversity, even though we carry that with real brokenness that we do. We do carry it. Um, Yeah. There's some ways I need to shed my Americanness, but some ways that my Americanness comes in handy because I have to be true and authentic to who I am mm. and at the same time of being intentional and mm. loving, hum- humble, and generous mm. wherever I am too. So, and yeah. not confusing your Americanness with what is the gospel. I think that's, that's the part right. of the identity crisis right. in, in the church in the U.S. and other places right now is people are confusing things like their politics with the gospel. And there are places where they intersect and overlap in a way that is helpful. But there, we have to be mindful of the fact that there are lots of ways that when those things intersect and overlap, they're not helpful or faithful. And, and that's it's a hard thing for a lot of people, I think, to consider, especially when that thing has been so beneficial to you, you know, for, for as long as it as it has been. And so, you know, we're all, I think everybody's open to, to change as long as it doesn't cost them anything. <laughs> but as soon as it starts to cost things, Don't ask like anything of me. <laughs> letting go of things like my, my cultural identity in an effort to be more faithful to the gospel, well, wait a minute, who signs up for that? Yes, no, you're right. And I think we've experienced that, like the rest of the world has, I guess, through COVID, of people, you know, political decisions around these things, um, then get fused with people's faith, and Christians ta- start taking sides and drawing lines. And and much as I hate to say it, I think one of the negatives is coming out of COVID, I think New Zealand is a more divided nation now than we were. I think the church is probably a more divided church. Mm -hmm. So we've got our work to do. You know, we are divided along all the same lines that the U.S. would be divided, particularly along lines of politics. Uh, It looks different here, but some of those same things. Um, And so I, 
in some ways, I feel like that is kind of the job that I do week in and week out is just to keep calling back to that kingdom lens. And it's like, you know, take off the political lens for a while. That often tends to be the primary lens. And we see the gospel through the lens of our political ideology mm -hmm. rather than saying, let's flip that around and, and put this kingdom. I mean, we need to understand the kingdom of God. Yes, complexity. But the king, look at politics through the lens of the kingdom, through the lens of Jesus, and learn to see these things through the eyes of the gospel. And then do all that really fun work of figuring out what is the gospel and what are the parts of my culture that I might have attached to the gospel that actually, that's just my culture. The good gospel can look really different within um, a Maori community or within a Samoan community. And we'll sometimes get it wrong. And that's one of the things we're learning too. You know, there was a, a recent example where we used some Maori language in a particular context, and there was a line in there that I think would need, you know, needed to be reworded a little bit because there's always that line in in mission between contextualization and syncretism. Mm -hmm. And in that occasion, we had to reflect and go, okay, maybe we didn't quite get that right. But I think the lesson for me was like, that's that's a good thing to engage with. Yeah. Like we're, it, we're not always going to get it right, but let's not let that stop us from, from doing right. something. Have the difficult conversation. That's right, exactly. And have the courage to step into some of these spaces and do some of that cross-cultural work, acknowledging that, yeah, there's going to be imperfections and we have to learn from our mistakes along the way as well. Mm -hmm. Back to humility, right? That's, that's right. going to take, that took some humility for us, for us recently, but that's okay. It was a lesson learned. We move on. I'm glad we did it. So that makes me wonder, and this is sort of a technical question, who do you have that conversation with? Like, who is the person that said, oh, hey, that line, we shouldn't have said that that way. Is it Maori-speaking members of your congregation that pick up on that? I mean, how do you do that? Yes, well, there, there are, yes, so one or two, and not necessarily Maori themselves, but, and this is, you know, there are, there are Maori who speak Te Reo Maori, but there are also some uh, English, or some European New Zealanders who also speak Te Reo Maori. So it came from one or two of them, and it was also a conversation that we had as elders, and just reflecting back. And just and just thinking through, yeah. So yeah, good process, good learning. Uh, and I think for me, it's it's a case of yeah, let's not let's not stop doing this, but let's just let each time let's just learn and let's figure out that nuance. Uh, I mean, it's it's broadly speaking, it's the lesson of of the gospel moving into any cultural context, right? So that culture has all of its own worldview, and there will be elements of that worldview. There will be elements of the Maori worldview. There are that are completely compatible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The early missionaries knew this, and they would use Maori language, terminology, and the conceptual worldview of Maori to communicate the gospel. There will be other elements of Maori worldview and mythology and spirituality that won't be compatible with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's also okay to say that. I think that's that's fine. I think that's just good that's just good cross cultural mission. But figuring that out is <laughs> swear it comes tricky. Yeah. That's right. And that's the intersection of mission, mm -hmm. I think, is to do that work of contextualization. But I guess I'm just trying to, in some ways, this, it is complicated and hard and we're going to fail, but let's still do it. So that's kind of, that, that's, that's where we're at. But you're right, it does, it does take good Maori voices as well who can then represent a faithful, a faithful perspective on that. Yeah. When we talk about abiding relationships, one of the characteristics of a healthy abiding relationship is that by getting to know you, your community... I'm probably going to find that there are things about the way you see yourself and your community that are different from what I thought. Yeah. And that means there also might be things that I thought were going to be helpful in our relationship that actually aren't helpful. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not open to hearing that, first of all, taking the time to have that conversation and to hear you say to me, yeah, actually you're getting that wrong. Mm -hmm. If I, if I can't, again, have that humble posture where, where we can take the time to have that conversation, where you know that there's enough trust between us for you to be honest with me and say to me, you're doing that wrong and that's really not helpful. And then for me to not just grumble and walk away from that, but to say, okay, let's continue having this conversation and making sure that your voice is being heard and considered and honored. I mean, to me, that's all, it's sort of, Again, I'm used to thinking of this in these long distance missional relationships, but it, you know, in this case, it's just, that was in your liturgy, <laughs> you know, that kind of interaction, which means you're being just as mindful of abiding, of creating abiding relationships within your worship space as you are between continents. Yeah, totally. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great insight. Yes. And I think to be, 
to be in a posture where we're always learning that and and always being open. So I mean, I, I've lived in New Zealand all my life. Like this is this is my home. I'm pretty embedded here, okay. but easy for me to just then assume my world is pretty normative, and my language is is pretty normative. Uh, but I constantly have to challenge myself with that. I mean, it was only last week that I learned that the term Kiwi is one that many Maori don't connect with and don't relate to. And I mean, that, that, that doesn't mean we need to stop using it, but I think just good to be aware. Like that, that, that term Kiwis, you know, and New Zealanders get called Kiwi all around the world. Right. Um, but for many Maori, that has connotations of World War One and II, uh, where they served in the New Zealand Armed Forces as a way of essentially trying to earn European favour and felt like that was never returned to them. Uh, and because of that, some of them don't, many don't connect with the term Kiwi. That was really, that was new learning for me. That was interesting. I've taken that on board. I don't quite know what I'm going to do with that yet. But I think just those kinds of, you know, that's just, there's ongoing learning we always need to be open to do. So even when we feel like we've got culture figured out, we right. we don't. Right. <laughs> I don't. Can you share the context for how you, how did you learn that? Oh, just this was at a, a, a church leader's day in Auckland. Yeah, the same uh, Maori archdeacon that I was referring to earlier, part Maori. Uh, who's a deacon in the Maori Anglican Church. There are three streams of Anglicanism in New Zealand, uh, Pākehā, Maori, and Pacific. He is an archdeacon in the Maori stream of the Anglican Church uh, and was sharing, actually was one of his colleagues sharing how just insights around the Maori worldview and the connection between Maori and church as an understanding of how to connect to and relate to Maori. And that was just one of the insights that he shared Part of it was just cutting through stereotypes. Yeah. It's just so easy to culturally stereotype. And so even within our culture, we can do that, European to Maori or Pacific or Fijian or whatever it is, which we do all the time, right? Because stereotypes are easy and our brains don't have time to process nuanced information all the time. So we just go for the easy, lazy caricatures of people. And I think we've got to constantly push ourselves not to do that, which comes back to relationship, like knowing people, flesh and blood, getting to know their story, their history, their people, their land. And building on that and just refusing the easy generalizations and really pushing for deeper relationship. And that's the theme of this podcast, isn't it? That's Humility right. and openness. We just keep circling yeah. back to it, yeah. but that is ultimately what it takes. Maybe there's something there. Maybe there's something there. <laughs> that's well, right. I'd just like to know, Matthew, I know we're sort of getting, getting close on time, but what are you the most excited about right now as a church leader in New Zealand, in this community? Yeah, I'm excited about a couple of things. I mean, we've talked about the renewal coming through uh, various cultural cultural streams within New Zealand. I think that's exciting. I think for New Zealanders who feel uh, beaten up by culture, who feel isolated and marginalized in secular environment, it's exciting to have that sense that people are turning to Christ, that there is spiritual uh, interest, uh, and that's good. And it's going to be really interesting to see where that goes. Personally, in my own ministry context, I'm really interested in a renewal of biblical preaching in a New Zealand context and believe that that is needed and is slowly happening. And it's not that there's no place for outside voices, but I'm really interested in being part of a renewal of homegrown indigenous exposition of scripture for the New Zealand church and the global church, but maybe from the New Zealand church. And so I feel like that's that's a part of my calling and part of the work that I do at Laidlaw. And to see that happening and to see places where there is increasing biblical and theological depth and rigor and good work being done in the biblical text and wrestling with all these things we've been wrestling with around how that looks. Because of course, you know, coming to scripture is cross-cultural work as well, from our culture to scripture, and then recognizing that the biblical context is a, is a culture and God's revealed himself to us within a culture and a people. And that all needs careful nuancing and interpretation as well. But helping others to do that work well, seeing places where it is being done well, and even even seeing my preaching students at the moment go out and preach in their churches and just seeing that being a really life-giving thing for them and for their churches and believing that that's happening. Uh, they don't always see it on the faces of the people you're preaching to, but it's believing the Spirit is at work in those, in those contexts. So I see that happening and I see preaching in New Zealand being in a different place, I think, than it maybe was uh, a generation ago, which is great. I think expository preaching in particular is really taking strides in New Zealand. So that kind of resonates with my heart because I'm a Bible teacher. So I love that. I love seeing that. And to see it reflected across cultures as well is is wonderful. So those would be, I think, two things I would name that I'm, I'm excited about what I'm seeing around us. And yeah, even as I'm saying it, it's really good to be reminded of because as a pastor, you're always dealing with the stuff that's not going right in the church. But to lift my eyes up and go, you know, God's doing good things, you know, within our nation. It's really exciting. And it brings us to, we're, we're a small little country 
And so these things actually bring Christians together, which is really good. I don't think we have quite the same denominational barriers and things that maybe other places have. We're just too small for it, yeah. honestly. Uh, we, we've just got to collaborate. Yeah. And so you do see churches working together a little more. Uh, we're part of a collective of a few different churches that are going to do a preaching series together. And these are quite different churches. There's us, there's more charismatic church, charismatic history at least, in the city, and a uh, primarily Pacific Island church in South Auckland. Next year, we'll join together for a preaching series, which will be kind of an integrated church series across multiple ministries, A Journey Through the Life of Jacob. Oh, so wow. fantastic. You know, that's that's, that's going to be good. And it's going to be good for us. Like that's going to challenge us as a church. Yeah. That's going to bring a different cultural dynamic into our church yeah. through having uh, the preacher of uh, New Life Church, Manurewa, preaching in our context. And that's all really good. So talk about making people uncomfortable. Yep, yeah. we're up yeah. for a bit of that. Yeah. <laughs> can we come back for that? Yes, yeah. we can. You are welcome to. Yeah, oh, that, that, is, that is all exciting, and we're excited for you. Yes. Um, thank you so much for for spending this time with us. It's been fascinating for me, and I know it will be for the listeners too. Ashley, I want to make sure that in the show notes mm-hmm. that you put a link to the sermon yep. podcast that you listen to, It'll so folks there. can can tune into that as well. But yeah. just thank you. That's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me on and bless you in the work that you're doing. This is such an important voice, the Broken Banquet podcast, and just a great voice into global mission. There are exciting things happening, not just in New Zealand, but around the world. So thank you for being a part of that and giving voice to some of what God's doing. Thank you. Thanks, Ruben. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Will. Bye, Ashley. (laughs) You've been listening to The Broken Banquet, a podcast by Will Bailey and Ashley Goad. Music provided by Irene and the Sleepers. Join us next week for another episode. He's prepared the table. All things are ready. Come to the feast.